sorry. Yeah. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so um, th there was a question where someone was asking, is it possible to have 100% accountability, right? And um, for the way I see it also, um, accountability is a two-way street, right? Mm, um, yeah. Is, it, is there any way that personal accountability for some reason has influence on public accountability. Yeah, I mean, the, the fiber of the individual will determine all of these things. And your, your political education, your civic education, your sense of personal responsibility will determine a lot. We are in a presidential system, so it's heavily monetized. So, I mean, as you can see, it's becoming a race to the bottom. Those who have the big pockets, you know, are the ones who are getting the opportunities to move up the ladder. You know, it was Timola and Rolari Waju that made a tweet recently and said, in 1999, we had 39 year old governors, 40 year old governors. Um, but you don't have the same scenario these days anymore because it, it's a power it was not passed downwards, it was passed sideways. Um, and that's what you get because a whole lot of people is become like, who has the resources to be there? So they are not, they're not going there with the best intentions. Um, and, but someone that was in a public office understand that this is trust, you know. Uh, any position in public office, even in, in the private sector, is trust. Um, to a certain level that people trust you and people give you money, invested in you, um, and believe that you would be true to them. You would do your best to, to give them higher returns. Um, and the same thing with public office. It's a position of trust. So you have to even first understand that basic knowledge, you know, that I have, I've been, something that things have been put in my care, I have to be accountable for them. And so you can't teach someone who doesn't understand that basic concept, accountability. You can't. You can't explain it to them because for them, but for a lot of people, it's an opportunity to to grow, uh, to create, to to just make money. And like someone is saying, because he says, a system, it's it, accountability has to be systemic. It can't be wrapped around the individual. Um, when we are in a public office, it's something that we would say. This is how we do things. And in a country like Nigeria, where the leadership trying to reflect loudly on the entire space, uh, you would understand that every sum of institution starts to conform to that kind of understanding, that this is how we run public resources. We must be efficient with it. We must be equitable with it. And also, we must be transparent about it. And we must be open to feedback, you know, about how these resources are spent. So a lot of times, and that's why when, when we elect leaders, you know, and which is something we have to put in mind, we have to look at their track record, you know, we have to look at how they run their businesses. You know, did they build business? Did they build bridges? Did they, they were they accountable? Did they grow things? And when they grew things, was it? I mean, I mean, and did they, did they build things? Were they, I mean, and I'm not talking about narrowing this into just making the entrepreneurs, political leaders. No, I'm just talking about what exactly is the track record of leading things and building things, and how were they accountable within the systems? You know, is maybe a good idea to talk to their workers, to talk to people who've had experiences with them over the years. Because if, if you don't have it, you can't give it. Um, it's something that I've learned around how our public, and that's why our public space is, is in a defective state. A lot of people get into public office and it's just all around them and not about building systems. Yeah, um, okay, so I, I, there's always this talk about building systems, building systems. One of the big challenges that Nigeria has faced is the bulk of its public uh, service workers, right? Um, civil servants, etc., including elected officials. Um, how do you build a system around an existing system that's set up to oppose whatever comes up, right? How do you build in um, a system of transparency or accountability um, that works or that is adoptable? If, if there's anything we know about change, change is always resistant. Right, and we keep saying, um, we keep saying that the problem is the leadership, the leadership, the leadership. Leadership oftentimes cannot work um, without this, the system itself. But what happens where the system is set up in a way that it is, uh, you know, very much opposed to change? How do you influence change in that kind of scenario? So um, when you say. There's always going to be resistance. There's going to be a pushback when it comes to us trying to 
effect a system of accountability and like because especially when it comes to the public space we have a we still have this 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 residue of military um government mentality in our minds i mean we are the we are in government we have power we are ruling the people and when you hear those kind of languages you know um that is not a language of someone who, is, who understands and the place of public trust and how he has to be accountable. I mean, look at the old Twitter ban of a thing. Um, an accountable system will listen and will we'll look at the entire thing in a broader scope to say, okay, um, the people who are using this space for hatred, for prejudice, for, for secessionist intent, but there are also bigger issues around commerce and around civic rights and things like that. What do I draw a line and how do I make sure that I give opportunity to both sides? But you know, when they, you have a leader who does not believe that, they has to look at the broad picture. Because, I mean, accountability starts by thinking about the broad picture. I understand that I don't exist here on my own account. I don't exist here for the benefit of myself. There are bigger interests, uh, which has the interest of the people and which can be multifaceted. You know, and I have to take care of all of those interests technically. Um, so that's for me what you would do when you say you want to build a system. You are first thinking about everybody. You also have to look at within your own bureaucracy. Um, the thing about the bureaucracy I have learned about civil service is that it responds to the to the to the to the individual. You know, people say the institution, what we call institution, is actually a letting shadow of an individual, which means that whatever the leader mirrors is whatever is what permits the system, and that becomes quietly the culture. And quietly, you see that for those who have kept the consistency in terms of the kind of leadership that they have or the quality of leadership that they have. There's a, way the, there's a way the system responds to that. There's a way that's ingrained into the culture. But what you have in Nigeria is that you even have few people who have even tried. So maybe you have someone who is a spark of joy in two years out of a period of 20 years. It's not going to change it after dynamically. Even a system like in the U.S. where you have had a long uh, culture of um, people doing things in a proper manner. When you had a Trump, you still had that system was tested. You know, like Biden said, democracy went through into 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 a battle and it prevailed. So in a way, those systems can still be tested. And that's what you call culture. But what you have in Nigeria is not it has to be redefined. It has to be rewarded. And the way you build a system is that you need to make it you as a leader of accountability. It has to start with you. And two, being able to be able to reward or punish anything that is not empty. And those who don't show the best examples of accountability are also equally punished. So what we call culture is what you reward and what you punish. Um, and that's exactly how we have to build systems that are tied to accountability. We'll be able to institutionalize things like that. I can, I, Monkey, and I, I apologize for that again. Um, so, if you can hear me, um, I, I, I want to ask you, if you, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Better? Yeah, it's okay, better. Great. Okay, great. I, I, I want to ask you, right? Um, I agree that change is hard. I agree. I've seen comments around innovating. Um, around, um, you know, the dinosaurs we have in government and all that. But my question is, is how do we make governance um, unattractive for the dinosaurs in government and make it attractive for willing young leaders? 
how do we make governance unattractive for dinosaurs in government? That's, that's, and make it, at the same time, be able to make it attractive for willing young leaders. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, about, it's about the privileges in the office um, and being able to be deliberate about that. So there is no, you're not going to become a multi-millionaire in the UK by becoming a member of parliament. Uh, your wage structure is not in is out, is not out of sync with an average wage structure of people. So let's say the average wage structure in Nigeria, let's say for someone that is a senior um, professional in Nigeria is two million naira. Let's just assume that's two million. That means we don't expect a member of National Assembly to earn more than two million naira a month. You know, even if it's eight hundred thousand, we stick with so because so you don't go into that space just because there's an opportunity to steal a billion naira or to influence a contract. And so that's the first challenge that the space has become so monetized. And that also that is also coming from the demand from the system. A lot of people you also spend so much in trying to run for public office in Nigeria. I mean, you don't see that in a much more decent. And even if you said you see that it's more of like their interest, the people who contribute towards political causes and things like that. And that's what we have to significantly change. The system is so attractive um, to carpet baggers and to you know, to people who really want to want to just flex on public resources. And so until we're able to, and it's not because the system mm, ideally does not define what is due to people. It's just that a lot of people are with extraneous payments for themselves. So how much does the National Assembly member my hand technically? Maybe nine hundred thousand. You know, the governor ends around 1.6 million. The president ends around 2.1 million. I mean, that is like what is written in the law. <laughs> but everybody finds a way to put security votes for themselves. I mean, the, everybody, the minister will run a huge impressed account, you know, for himself. The the legislature awarded themselves huge allowances for their office. So, in a way, what they did was to circumvent every form of legislation and created new opportunities to distribute. And those are the things that need to change. And until those things change, where every single, where people see public office as service, which is just how it should be. Um, and, and, you know, what you see in like different societies is that it becomes like a track record. Even it could be ideologically driven, but it's a track record. So you see that a lot of people that were appointed by the Biden administration had worked in the Obama administration. So, I mean, maybe ideologically they left, but they're back on that track record. A lot of people will fall through that cracks, new people will join it. Right? The current deputy treasury secretary was a deputy national Adv security advisor of that Obama. So, track record. And the same thing happens with the Republican. If another Republican wins again, the new set of people, the same set of people who have been possibly worked in the Trump or in the Bush era, would still go back and continue with the Republican era. So that's the kind of way that this has and that's why I want to say and because and, and in the leave public office, they're not trying to become a senator or yes or rep. They go back into academia, into non profits, into businesses. They go back to living becoming normal people. And that's what we have to normalize in Nigeria. People try people go to public office and it has become like a last bus stop for them. You know, this is like, this is the end of it all for them. Whereas, you see, I mean, I, I schooled in Colombia, and I know that, like, I had three lecturers. I mean, one, two of them are working in the current administration of Biden. They were in the Obama administration. They were senior roles, and they are, so it's some sort of way. They did they, they, they not, they built some form of value around themselves beyond public office. And that's one of the key things we also have to be on the lookout for. But the problem we have is that the political system we run is heavily monetized and it's become a huge attraction to people who can acquire wealth in a significant manner or and it could even be in an illicit manner. Um, and so because you have to, you know, it costs a whole lot to run for public. So what has to change is the dynamics of our political system needs a whole lot of reappraisal because it will continue to attract not the best of us. Um, it will not because of the way we have heavily monetize it. And if it means that we um presidential system, maybe that's the way I right hear. Yeah. Okay, so um I, I hear you loud and clear, honestly. Um about doing away with the presidential system. That's a that's a very that's a long conversation on the whole thesis mm. on its own, mm. right? Um I know that with budget, right, you mm. and your colleagues have done um, a lot of work holding governments accountable, particularly tracking, you know, ensuring that the transparency we're talking about, um, citizens understand what their responsibilities are, where it requires holding government accountable, and also ensuring that 
government understands that if you're doing this thing, you're doing it because the citizens have given you a mandate to do that. Um, can you talk us through, you know, a little bit as why you do what you do and mm. how that has helped to a certain extent and what are the challenges? What, what, what does every person who wants to go that path, well, what, what do, should they look out for and what do they think, what do you think is the one thing or is the few things um, that are critical in holding government accountable? I mean, so in, in a way, um, what do what 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 do I, I mean? I, I was a banker. I was I was a banker at First Bank. Got bored of it. You know, thought I could do something. I was different. And by a stroke of luck and grace, I I found this opportunity to build. And I was just sitting by my desk, and I said, okay, why not budget? Why not accountability? I mean, why not public resources? Because growing up. You know, I have my book coming out next week, and I wrote a part of that in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I said, it's like, when we're growing up, I, whenever there's a, in the afternoon, maybe like a Sunday afternoon, everybody gathers, trying to watch a soap opera or trying to watch a football match, maybe Nigeria is playing. And 30 minutes before the end of, before the match, boom, power is off. Um, then you, then you cussing, you're hungry, you're pissed off. I mean, there was no time, was no a time of, Better pass my generator everywhere right now. Even televisions that we had VHS and you know were really really scarce. You know, I remember those days. My mom would hide our 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 VHS recorder under the bed and try and wrap it in because they say when I'm robbers come, the first thing they ask for is the VHS recorder. I mean, those those. I mean, it, it was it was well, it was it was it, it it gave a lot of things to me while I was young about why does it have to be this way? Why can't it just be power? I remember, I remember those days I would. I mean, I, I mean, I'm coming from school. I will watch. I mean, everybody was always putting their power, their, their bulbs on. So I'll be watching each of the houses. Whose bulb is on? Oh, there's bulb. Where is their bulb is on? Ah, there's power. There's power. When they almost get in there, then there's no longer power. So somebody deposited in me while being young there. This can't be normal. I mean, this can't be a decent society. That I mean, this is not out of the world to have power all the time. And so, in a way, I've always been in that questioning mode around the Nigerian space. Around the resources work for the people. Why was there so much poverty? I mean, why is it, why is the education system so much in shambles? You know, and, and that question is what gives rise to budget, and which I think every citizen should do. Every citizen should be in a mode of questioning. Everybody to say why is it not this? Why? Because it is the questioning, and in that overload of questioning, that people get people in public office get to reflect and get to say, okay, we can be better. You know, we can be better. I mean, your default, you can praise government when they do right, but your default mode should be questioning. You know, should be a sense of anger, like, this is not proper. This is not right. Um, and that's what informed the budget. And it's a simple thesis that until Nigerians in their self enlightened interest organize together and demand efficient resources, their issues will continue, be play, will, will continue not be a major one but people in political class. There are too many interests competing for public resources. People want to inflate contracts. People want to buy cars. They want to enjoy lots. But there are also needs of schools, hospitals, roads, you know, small grants to businesses. I mean, that are necessary to really, really jumpstart the system. So the Nigerians have to really, really get their voices loud when it comes to around optimizing public resources because there's so much waste in the way we manage public resources in Nigeria. And that's tied to the political elite and how they run things. So that mode of questioning is what we have to do. You know, someone says, I want to go and put a, a, a desert, a, a training institute in a desert training institute by the Nigerian. You have to question that. I mean, why is why can't you use the one that the Nigerian army has in Baga? I mean, what's new? Why do you have to create something new? You know, I mean, somebody is trying to... We have state governors, and nobody's saying how much of your state, how much investment has the state government brought in. I mean, I mean, before how much schools, how much education has it transformed? How much healthcare has it transformed? You know, why was dollar six years ago? Why is it becoming like five oh five right now? These citizens have to be in the mode of constantly questioning and holding public officers to account, so they can show them that there are fault lines, and you need to just do better. Um, and that's what is the whole thesis of budget. You know, giving people the right information in a simplified manner so that they can do public officers to account. And I think it's it's not my cross, it's not my only work alone. I think it's a work every Nigerian needs to be involved in. We also have a kind of transformative society that we need. Yeah. Okay. Um so other Joshua, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we all know that um 
for public officials, right? The, another mm. public office is the retirement home. For governors, we know they are going to National Assembly to retire. Um, mm. For those who have retired from the House of Assembly, they are aiming to go up to the National Assembly or perhaps run for governor to get some immunity for some crimes that may or may not have been committed. You know, basically we recycle public officials, elected mm. public officials. What else can pub these political leaders do after public office? You know, considering you know the peculiarity of the terrain, those of them who have not remained in public office have found themselves in jail or outside the country or running away from the law or being prosecuted for one thing or the other. I would say only a few leaders, maybe like the former um, president of Asanjo, uh, just one of the few um, who is not embroiled in one. Um, uh, scandal or the other with EFCC and the rest. What else can these political leaders do after public office? I mean, it's, it, it's also, also normalizing the word service in the public service. That's what it has to be. Uh, we have to find a way to fully normalize it and, and make sure that it's about service. And so when you finish serving your term, you go back home and you continue contributing to the private sector enterprise. I mean, we have too many people that they should be, after they run public office, maybe four, six, eight years, you should go back to private business and to be paying taxes and to contributing to business. That's the way it should be. Um, you have people like Tony Blair, David Cameron, you know, um, they left public, they, they left, they ended their tenure as an, as an MP. I mean, they're going back and maybe to long leading think tanks. I mean, some of them wrote books and made a whole lot of money from it. I mean, like Barack Obama is writing books, is running the foundation. And it's right. I mean, we have to normalize people leaving public office. We have to even normalize people not running for second time. We have to normalize people saying, you know, I'm tired. But you are, a, you are a chief of staff. Then you became a governor. Then you became a minister for another eight years. I'm sure if you are not for another minister for another eight, six, eight years, you say you want it. Or you are like a speaker and you are now like a governor. And from a governor, you also another eight minister for eight years. I mean, I worry that. Do I want to spend 24 years of my life saying I'm serving the public? If it's service, I mean, it should take a toll on you and you know at the point, it's enough. I want to go back to maybe throwing my children, my grandchildren up in the patio and just being happy and watching the sunrise and sunset and maybe play golf with friends. That's the way I see it. it should be if it's service. It takes a lot of you. It takes a toll on you in terms of your own family and a whole of things. I mean, I, I took a job as a as a special advisor, the technical advisor to the government for a very short period before I left to resign. And I knew that in that period, I was stuck in Abuja. My family does not live in Abuja. And when it was a whole lot to say, okay, I have to always travel back and forth to the US, Nigeria to see my family. I had to look at my own personal reputation. Can I defend everything happening inside that government? So even for me, it was like a huge tool. You can't compare that to the freedom I have running budgets, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, managing budget. I love that freedom. So when people find the attraction to public office and they're so, they're so engrossed about it, like, if it's not because there's something on forward that you're trying to drag there, why does this seem so fascinating that after you, you should have done your time and transit and move on, you think that this must be a perpetual resting place for you. And these are the kind of things that Nigerians need to resist. You know, it's just very fortunate that we've built an elite, you know, a political class, you know, a, a, a grassroots that has become that, that has become so monetized in the system. And so, in a way, just like people that say I have enough resources to even bamboozle their way and get their way to to continue to be in public office. But it's a time for Nigeria, young Nigerians, a counter elite to start resisting that. You've served your time. You keep moving, keep it moving, you know, and, and, and that's just it. And and that's the way. You should make public officer, but people should find means to be. When I, and I so many people like the, the deputy chief of staff, uh, the, the deputy treasury secretary of the US, Wali, he went to BlackRock, which is one of the biggest investment houses in the world. From there, he was the President Obama Foundation. One of the persons I knew, there was also the head of that director of national intelligence, he was a lecturer in Columbia University. People went to, to academia, moved to non profit leadership, and government. That's the way. She, I know people, people say power is sweet, that maybe when you have 100 officers saluting you, um, when you have a, a tent convoy in front and the back of you, everybody's clearing the way for you, maybe you get lost in that trap and you just don't want to leave that space. But to be very honest with you, if you really check your moral fiber, you begin to wonder, is that the essence of why we are here? The real reason why we are here is to serve the public.
you know and so if you have done your time in that space i mean you should you should call it quits and give an opportunity to fresh ideas and you know even the way we run, I run budget i've been in budget for 10 years and i'm no longer the ceo of budget i and i've just done nine years in the organization so i just do a lot of work around strategy and fundraising i don't because i also feel like maybe I, maybe my ideas out of after running for nine years might not be the best to keep the organization going we have to normalize people working in public service exiting and we have to normalize dead political careers yes like people are, 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 are done and they just move back into public service but this i i struggle with the idea of people just jumping from you know i mean and i, I had so many examples in nigeria I mean, people running for public running for presidency i mean for like almost six five years you've been vice president of a country that's one of the highest honor ever you can have in the country your legacy is there for forever you you, you go and you, you and you and you, and you are above 66 move on at 65 73 i don't know which fresh ideas you are bringing to the table i'm sorry it sounds like i'm being ageist but i'm sorry leadership must also know when it is time to move on and understand that this is the position of me mentoring there was a story that someone spoke it was a majority leader in in the chicago senate you know and and barack obama was a young was a fresh senator on the chicago in, in chicago senate in Illinois senate and and, and Barack Obama came to meet him and said, I would like to move, run for the U.S. Senate because there's an opportunity there. And he went to meet, the man told us the story when I met him, and he went to meet um, some of the funders, the Democratic funders, the Democratic donors to say, there's this young guy, fresh green young guy from Harvard, he's trying to run for um, for U.S. Senate. And some people called him and said, ah, you have been in this U.S. Senate for 10, 15 years. Why are you not the one? You know, running for the U.S. Senate. Why this young boy that's, not, that's barely even spent four years, you know, that's trying to now move to the U.S. Senate? But he said he knew his limitations. He knew his limitations, and he knew that for that kind of dynamism that that role needed, this guy was much more grounded and much more aware to lead it. And that's what we need to be in Nigeria. People should know the limitations, if actually it's for public service. But if it's for something else, that's why we know people don't know where to draw the line as much as possible. I, I mean, I, I mm -hmm. really wish that that's the new mindset we have because it's proven, I mean, the kind of leadership that we've had, even when we run in Nigeria right now, that a lot of ideas that you see, when people talking about grazing roots, you know, 1861, you know, 19, <laughs> 2021, I mean, it shows that, you know, they, they, they're not yeah. in sync. I mean, you know, not, and people even can't even understand how ranching and how efficiency you have to put by livestock. How you, I mean, how it's yeah. important for them to 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 feed and how the economy around ranching. I mean, the people, the people that will grow the grass. I mean, people, I mean, being able to even explain that, how do you you can't even teach that. So yeah. in a way, people you have to normalize. People saying you have saved your time. It's time for fresh yeah. ideas. Yeah. I, I, I think so. I, I agree. I totally agree with you, honestly. And um, I think that the same way that we've ha handled public service, um, it's the same way that we've run uh, private businesses with um, having um, the same set of ideas repeat itself over and over in private institutions, right? Um, the reason why mm -hmm. we have a cake, a cake ideas in public service is still the same reason why you don't find transgenerational company in Nigeria because what we're stuck to the idea of ownership once we get mm. into a position of leadership the idea the concept yep. of service is missing right service is missing as a concept for leadership we're stuck in ownership and you mm. find out that even private in private institutions there's a lack of transparency there's a lack of accountability um and that keeps killing organizations you don't see them going from one generation to the other there's no um there's no plan to transfer leadership mm. even in mm. civil society organizations you find this same yep. thing, which is why I, I find it very noble you know um that you're saying that after nine years you've at least shifted to the side to have um, a different set of ideas coming to budget it's it's Um, someone is saying, what steps can young people, I really don't like the word youth, so I'm just going to say young people, what steps can young people take to correct um, the 
I'm, I'm not exactly sure there's something for young people to correct, but I'm, asked, I'm going to ask the question as it is. How, what steps can young people take to correct this while still maintaining civility? Um, I, because I'm not the one who's speaking, sharing with the one who's, <laughs> who we have as the guest today. So what, what's your thoughts on the question? What steps can young people take to correct um, the things that are wrong in leadership currently and still maintain civility while doing it? Yeah, I mean, I think something we must realize is that power will not, not like what Nobu says, you know, which is true. This power will not be served a la carte. So it's not like they're going to create a big buffet for us. And it says, go and take uh, and then take power. Even if they're going to do that, they will run it into their own downstream and where they know that they can still control things. If young, ethical-minded Nigerians want power or want to influence political leadership in Nigeria, they must start up and do it. They must organize themselves. What we lack as young people is organization. The political class, I mean, the strongly core political class understand organization. Even when the interest does not seem bothered at this point, they still organize themselves in a way that they still remain relevant. As young people, we are so distrusting of each other. Um, we, are so in, we worry about each other's intentions. And so we have not been able to effectively organize those people. So I believe that we need to band together, organize, and put together our forces and say, this is how we're going to do this, in a way. Um, we also have to bring innovation in. Um, we can't say this is the way things are, because that's what people love to see. Um, we need to have think this problem. We need to bring new ideas, the dynamism of the youth. And that's come with how we approach this, but now we are able to shift the system. Um, that's something we have also not done enough, um, in a way. Um, and I think if we are able to... Um, do that effectively, come together. There's power in numbers. I mean, these guys might have a 10 billion naira sitting somewhere. You know, if 10,000 of us can can easily match that, you know, but one person or young person would not easily match that. And I think that's something that we ourselves need to be much more do. We also need to do what with proximity. Um, there's this aloofness that we have, or there's this fantasy that we have around the in Nigeria it works. It's not it's not about Nigeria is not an Instagram country, it's not a Twitter country, it's not a Facebook. It might be a two if I'm saying a Facebook country, but it's not a Twitter. Country. So it's not so when you find that so we we think it's this small cocoon of enjoying having fun and partying now. Uh, the the people in the people of Nigeria are rural are semi urban and grassroots, they challenge, they are suffering, their options are limited. And so we must be proximate to those issues. We must be seeing that we are building trust in those environments. Because it's in the environment that we are able to exercise that we are the new sources of power to them. Um, because without that, they still begin to just engage with the people that they know and do trust with them, even no matter how transactional or that flood that system is. So young people, we need that boldness. We need that courage. Something that always strikes my mind is when we look at independent fathers of Nigeria, you know, we see them as maybe they were old people. No, Awolowo in 1951. Awolowo was, was born in Chiba. Awolowo was 1910. He was born in 1909. So 1951, when he was even leading the West, Western region, that means he was just 40, yeah, maybe 42 years old. And Akintola was 41. And you had even people like Bodhi Thomas in their face. Zeke was maybe the only person that was relatively maybe old, maybe 45 or 48. Um, and people like Ujuku, I don't even personally were just even being born then and things like that. Or maybe we don't even in your teenage years then. So when you look at it technically, this so there were people that were sixties in Nigeria at that time. There were people that were seventies in Nigeria at that time. Um and so this way so it was not like Nigeria started with the age grade of Chief Aulo was at that point. It means that they because they approached the God, they used their privilege, which was education, and they approached things for the position of we will go with courage. And we go together. So they form political caucus, they form political groups. Those are the kind of things we should start doing at this point. You know, banding together, forming groups together, creating that connections together, and do it with a position of courage. And without us not doing that, we can't really influence the space as young people. And I'm not talking about it has to be a new party. It could be, say, PDP. And I like what Demo Larry Waju did yesterday, calling out his party. We did not put young people in the e registration process of our party. That's how we should be. We have the numbers. Nigeria is a young. Nigeria is not a old pop. It's not a old country. It's a young. It's a country of young people of Nigeria. It says enough is enough. We want to change the dynamics of this country. It will change. It will change. But it's, the young people also in Nigeria is also a spectrum. The person who is partying in Instagram, the person who is having fun, the person that steals ballot boxes, the person who is living an hopeless life.
person who does not have a job after spending eight years at school, they are all young people. So we also must understand we need everybody on board. So I, in my own view, I feel we need our organization. We need courage, you know, and we need to be proximate to the real issues of Nigeria. Those are the kind of things that will make us be able to take an opportunity in this country. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Um, this Thank has you. been uh, the Bridge Leadership Conversation hosted by the Bridge Leadership Foundation. We've been talking about transparency, accountability as a strategy for effective leadership. Um, Cheryl is with Budget. Uh, he's a crusader for accountability and transparency across all spectrum. Um, we had giveaways, but we, because of some technical difficulties, we will not be able to do that. But I promise that if you join us on the 26th of June at 1 p.m., everything that you didn't get today, you'll be able to get on that day, and we'll be hosting Dr. Omano on that day. Um, with, we're registering, if you want to register for the Foundation Career Day, it's a look at the pinned um, message. It's easy, bit.ly forward slash 2021 career day, and you'll go straight to the link. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, it's always Thank you. a pleasure having a chat with you. On Thank you so much, now. It's a pleasure, too. Thank you so much for joining us. And, like, I'm going to close with your word. We will go with courage. We will go with yeah. courage. Thank you so much. I appreciate having you. Thank you. And have a wonderful time. Thank you. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been the Bridge Conversation. Um, thank you so much for engaging. And we look forward to having you again the same time, 1 p.m. on 26th of June, Saturday, where we'll be engaging with Dr. Omano. Please register for the Foundation Career Day. We'll be having different people share different um, ideas and practical steps for effective leadership. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>